segment that we talked about last week in 2 Kings 13. And then we'll, we'll go on from there, try to get through as much as we can of these, particularly the kings of, of Israel, the northern kingdom. There's a couple of southern kingdom, kingdom of Judah, mixed in here. So I've got them here on the board as well. I'm going to check them off as we get through each one so we can kind of see where, where we're at on, on going through the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. And so our goal would be to get to chapter 17. We may, probably won't make that, but uh, we're going to try to cut, get through this, uh, this, top, well, this topic here, Israel's decline and exile. That's the bullet point on your, on your outline at the bottom of page 9. And uh, that's what we're working on until about the middle of, of page 10. So let's, uh, let's begin our time with a word of prayer, preparing ourselves through the help of the Holy Spirit to, to open our hearts and our minds to receive God's word as God reveals it to us as we read and study and discuss. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for this new day this uh, day that we can truly rejoice and be glad in it. And we thank you for all that you have done, all that you continue to do, and all that you have promised that is yet to come, that gives us all that hope and anticipation of what the rest of eternity is all about. Um, and so we thank you, Lord, for your word that you've given us, uh, that we have your word of truth, we have your spirit of truth, and we have your son as the way, the truth, and the life. And so we, we thank you for all you've given us. And so we ask you now for the presence of the Holy Spirit, the filling of the Holy Spirit, as we study your word in Second Kings and grow in our understanding of, of the history of things and, uh, and how you interact with your, your creation. And so we thank you for who you are and, and all that you've done. So we just ask for a blessing upon the people who have come here and are in this place. We pray for others that may be listening in or hear this message, this teaching, and that uh, they too may want to uh, have a desire to grow in, in the knowledge of your word because all of your word is important. Some of the things are, are hard to hear, some of the things are hard to understand, but we know you've given us the help we need to better understand. So we thank you ahead of time for, for what your Holy Spirit will guide us to see. Each one of us, maybe each one of us, something different. So I thank you for this time and the people who have come. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I'm just going to so you should have your Bibles open to 2 Kings 13. We got through those first nine verses last week. I'm just going to summarize or highlight the critical things to emphasize a couple points in the account of Jehoaz, uh, the king of Israel at the time. Uh, and so, and you can, again, I encourage you to have this chart of kings of Israel at the top, the kings of Judah at the bottom, at least, at least gives us some, some time frames and some order and some good or bad results. And, um, and so it, it's, it's been handy for me to, to work from this and, and to uh, tie these things together. So um, I'll be probably referring to it as we go. So, so we're going to we're going to start right in with just an overview. I'm not going to read it word for word. These these nine these yeah these nine verses in chapter 13. I'm just going to point out to you the first three, or well, actually the first four, and then we'll talk about uh, some of the others uh, briefly. This was in the 23rd year of Joash. Remember Joash? We covered a couple weeks ago. He was the boy who became a king, seven year old. And he was saved, in, in essence, out of the line of Ahab, uh, whose whole family was wiped out. But uh, 
but he was saved out, out of it in order to maintain the line from David uh, because we know that the line had to be maintained all the way uh, to, you know, to Jesus. And so, um, so Joash was part of that. He was a young boy. He uh, was a good king, and he accomplished certain things that we read about in chapter 11 and chapter 12. <clears throat> so, and, and he was murdered. At the end of chapter 12, we see that he was assassinated by some of his own officials, and we'll see results of that as we move on here, uh, the retribution. He was assassinated, and so he was murdered, and so he died and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. So that brings us to his son, Jehoaz, I'm, I'm sorry, um, we go back to the, uh, to the kings of Israel after, at the time of Joash. And so we have this, uh, yeah, the, 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 first, the, first, the first king we're looking at is, uh, is Joash, the son of Ahaziah, the king of Judah, uh, when he was reigning. But Jehoaz is the son of Jehu. Jehu was the one who God used, if you will. He was, a, he was a bad guy, a bad king, but he destroyed basically the line of Ahab and Jezebel <coughs> primarily. And God favored him for doing that, for maintaining four kings following Jehu that would extend the time of the king, kings of Israel, um, even though um, they were primarily were all uh, bad kings. <laughs> because all the king, <coughs> kings of Israel were bad if you follow the chart. So let me go on here in chapter 13. In the 23rd year of Joash, son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoahaz, son of Je Jehu, Jehu, became king of Israel in Samaria. And he reigned <coughs> 17 years. This important next verse, which I've always mentioned, it kind of identifies who's good and who's bad. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. By the Lord's standard, he did evil. By following the, the sins of Jeroboam, that's the original king of the northern kingdom, Israel, the son of, the son of, uh, of uh, uh, Solomon, I'm sorry. So, <laughs> I can't remember all these characters. I'm getting old. <laughs> um, so anyway, and he reigned 17 years, but he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Um, so the Lord's anger, verse 3, this is the important one. This in verse 4, I want to mention because I probably just kind of ran through it briefly last week. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. And for a long time, he kept them under the power of Hazael, king of Aram, and Ben-Hadad, his son. And again, as I've mentioned several times, Aram is the location north of Israel we would generally connect it with much of Syria today in that part of the, of the Middle East. And so they were reigning over the, the northern kingdom of Israel, basically causing problems. And God had allowed that. And that's what we'll, we see here. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel, and for a long time he kept them under the power of the enemy. I just want to emphasize that because I know Raymond talks about it quite a bit in some of his teaching. It's God that's doing these things. God causes these things to happen. So when we see things that are being happening in our world today that, that are not in God's plan, God allows them to happen because he wants to bring attention to, to the wrongs that we choose um, and we, he wants to draw us back to his way. And so you can see that even in this time that God allowed this to happen, an oppression that occurred on the northern kingdom of Israel. And then verse 4, it's interesting that this particular king, Jehoaz, and yet he's not considered a good king, but at this point he sought the Lord's favor or grace. And the Lord listened to him. So even the unrighteous 
if it all fits in God's plan, may give grace or favor to even the unrighteous. And the Lord listened to him, for he saw, the Lord saw, how severely the king of Aram was oppressing Israel. And the Lord provided a deliverer for Israel, and they escaped from the power of Aram. So God not only caused the original oppression, but he took it away, or, or removed it, um, drew it back. And so that's, that's what's happening there. And then the people were able to go to their own homes and not be so fearful of Aram who kept uh, harassing them. Then we, we drop down to verse 8. Uh, well, really, let me just uh, talk about uh, yeah, the, the others. Is, you can kind of read for yourself. As for the other events of the reign of Jehoaz, all he did and, and his achievements are written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel. Jehoaz rested with his fathers. In other words, he died and was buried in Samaria. And Jehoash, his son, succeeded him as king. So that's what leads us to the next section, the son of uh, Jehoahaz, as Jehoash, his son, succeeds him. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this in its totality from verse 10 to the end of the chapter, which is verse 24, and then we'll talk about some of the things, because there's, this is the last account in this, this time frame of Elijah. So we're going to finish up our little chart that we handed out on the, the miracles. Miracles are, are, are things that Elisha was given uh, to do by God, given the power to do. And so we're going to see here in chapter 13, verses 14 to 19, what he prophesied and what would ultimately happen. And that will complete that one handout that I gave you earlier with the comparison of the things that God granted to Elijah, eight of them we, we counted, and Elisha was a double portion of the spirit of Elijah, and just happens to be 16, and you can maybe bicker over whether there's other things or well, some of these shouldn't be considered, but it does seem like he got a double portion of Elijah's spirit, and so we're, we're going to cover the last of them here, so <coughs> let me read this whole thing. From verse 10 to, to 20, 24. In the 37th year of Joash, <coughs> king of Judah, again referring back to, to Joash, the, Joash, the uh, king of Judah, Jehoash, Jehoash, son of Jehoahaz, became king of Israel in Samaria. And he reigned 16 years. And again, this verse 11 he did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn away from any of the sins of Jeroboam, who was the original son of Solomon, who started the, the split kingdom uh, and, and led uh, Judah, uh, son, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. He continued in them. As for the other events of the of the reign of Jehoash, all he did and his achievements, including his war against Amaziah, that was, would be the king of Judah at that time, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? Jehoash rested with his fathers, and Jeho uh, Jeroboam succeeded him on the throne. Jehoash was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. <coughs> okay, now we have this account stuck in here uh, we see the, the final acts of Elisha. Elisha said, um, now, well, no, no, in verse 14, now Elisha was suffering from the illness. We don't know the illness for sure what it was, but apparently it was, it was deadly, from which he died. Jehoash, king of Israel, went down to see him. And so this seemed like a good, good thing went down to see him and wept over him. My father, my father, he cried, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. Elisha said, get a bow and some arrows, and he did so. Take the bow in your hands, he said to the king of Israel. When he had taken it, Elisha put his hands on the king's hands, 
Open the east window, he said, and he opened it. Shoot, Elisha said, and he shot. The Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Aram, Elisha declared, you will completely destroy the Armenians at Ephek. So that's the prophecy. That's, you know, Elisha telling him what's going to happen. Then he said, take the arrows, and the king took them. Elisha told him, strike the ground. He struck it three times and stopped. The man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck the ground five or six times. Then you would have defeated Aram and completely destroyed it. But now you will defeat it only three times, only kind of like half a victory. And so, now he, to my knowledge, he didn't instruct him before he did it how many times to do it, but he should have, I guess, known. And so Elisha kind of rebuked him uh, for not striking it enough. And then we see that Elisha died and was buried. And then what happens? The Moabite raiders used to enter the, the country every spring. Once while some uh, Israelites were burying a man, suddenly they saw a band of raiders. So they threw the man's body into Elisha's tomb. When the body touched Elisha's bones, the man came to life and stood up on his feet. Another miraculous thing, we don't... We don't know the full, <laughs> the full account here, but, but even after his death, Elisha apparently had power that God had given him that could raise from the dead someone. Haziel, king of Aram, oppressed Israel throughout the reign of Jehoaz. But the Lord was gracious to them and had compassion and showed concern for them because of the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all the way back, going back to the original covenant that God gave to Abraham and his descendants, which is still in effect today and into the future. That's just my little addition to it. And so that's what, what God is still operating on and will finish it. And that's why when those that want to say God's done with Israel or, you know, all these things that biblically speak to the fact that there's much more, there's much more to come. And, uh, and all these things have a role. So even he was saying it here, uh, the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. To this day, he has been unwilling to destroy them or banish them from his presence. God still upholds that covenant, even if Israel did not fully. Hazael, king of Aram, died, and Ben-Hadad, his son, succeeded him as king. Then Jehoash, son of Jehoahaz, recaptured, recaptured from Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazael, the towns he had taken in battle from his father, Jehoaz. Three times Jehoash defeated the, him, and so he recovered the Israelite towns. So that's, that kind of ends the account of, of uh, Jehoash here, and put together chapter 13. So now we kind of skip, we go back to the tribes of Judah, to, to the king of Judah. And so we, we're going to talk about uh, Amaziah, the king of Judah, here in chapter 14. <clears throat> and uh, then it's mixed, chapter 14 is mixed with another king of Israel. Um, I'm sorry. No, chapter 14 is the is, uh, yeah, from after Amaziah will be Jeroboam II, which is the king of Israel. So that both the king of Israel and the king of Judah will be included in this, this reading of chapter, chapter 14. In the second year of Jehoash, son of Jehoaz, king of Israel, Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Jehoadin. She was from Jerusalem. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Important point. But not as his father. So in comparison to David, he still wasn't as righteous as, as uh, David in the eyes of the Lord. 
but not as his father David had done. In everything, he followed the example of his father Joash. The high places, however, were not removed, and you'll see that through even some of the good kings. They didn't fully remove the idols uh, that they were still worshiping, false idols. The high places, however, were not removed, and the people continued to offer sacrifices and burnt, burn incense there. <clears throat> After the kingdom was firmly in his grasp, now look at what he did. He, he inflicted revenge upon those officials who had killed his father, jo, Joash. After the, the kingdom was firmly in his grasp, he executed the officials who had murdered his father, the king. Yet did not put the sons of the assassins to death in accordance with what is written in the book of the law of Moses, where the Lord commanded... Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their fathers. Each is to die for his own sins. You know, very important point. We're each responsible for our own sins. He was the one who defeated 10,000 Edomites. Edomites are the descendants of Esau in the Valley of Salt and captured Selah in battle, calling it Jokah. Jokathiel, the name it has to this day. Then Amaziah sent messengers to Jehoash, son of Jehoaz, the son of Jehu, Jehu king of Israel, with the challenge, uh, come, meet me, face to face. So he's provoking a, a conflict. But Jehoash, king of Israel, replied to Amaziah, king of Judah, kind of in a... a uh, Scenario, a thistle in Lebanon sent a message to a cedar in Lebanon, the thistle being a very small plant, obviously, in a, you know, in the comparison to the cedars of Lebanon. Uh, Give your, your daughter to my son in marriage. Then a wild beast in Lebanon came along and trampled the thistle underfoot, the little, little plant underfoot. You have indeed defeated Edom, which is Edomites, talked about earlier, and now you are arrogant. And that's the whole crux of this. Um, he sees it, Jehoash sees it as Amaziah becoming arrogant. <clears throat> Glory in your victory, but, but stay at home. Why ask for trouble and cause your own downfall and that of Judah also? Sounded reasonable. Verse 11, Amaziah, however, would not listen. So Jehoash, king of Israel, attacked. He and Amaziah, king of Judah, faced each other at Beth Shemesh in Judah. Judah was routed by Israel, and every man fled to his home. Jehoash, king of Israel, captured, so he captured the king of Judah, Amaziah, the son of Joash, the son of Ahaziah, at Beth Shemesh. Then Joash went to Jerusalem and broke down the wall of Jerusalem from the Ephraim gate, pretty significant part of the, the wall, Ephraim gate to the corner gate, a section about 600 100 feet long. He took all the gold and silver and all the articles found in the temple of the Lord in the treasuries of the, of the royal palace. He also took hostages and returned to Samaria. And you kind of think about the goings on in Israel today, you know, with the enemies of, of Israel keeping hostages and so forth. As for the other events of the reign of Joash, what he did and his achievements, including his war among, against Amaziah, king of Judah, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? Jehoash rested with his fathers and was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel, and Jeroboam, his son, succeeded him as king. The, there's mention of the next king, his son. Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah, lived for 15 years after the death of Joash, son of Jehoaz, king of Israel. As for the other events of Amaziah's reign, <clears throat> are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? They conspired against him in Jerusalem, and he fled to Lachish. 
So there was an uprising within the area of Jerusalem. And so uh, Amaziah had to flee. And he went to Lachish, um, you know, a ways away. But they sent men after him to Lachish and killed him there. He was brought back by horse and was buried in Jerusalem with his fathers in the city of David. Then all the people of Judah took Azariah, who was 16 years old, another young king, and made him king in the place of his father, Amaziah. He was the one who rebuilt Elath and restored it to Judah after Amaziah rested with his fathers. So that um, kind of is the, the end of Amaziah and set, sets up uh, where we go from there with his, with his son who will reign for, for quite a long time. Azariah, um, whose other name is Uzziah, so we'll we'll get into that. But first, we have to we have to cover, cover Jeroboam the second, and he's um, in the rest of, of Second Kings here, uh, 23, 23 to twenty nine. So I can read that, and we'll we'll get through that, and then we'll talk about where we're at. In the fifteenth year of Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah. Jeroboam, son of jo Jehoash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria, and he reigned 41 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn away from any of the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. He was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Lebo Hamath to the Sea of Arabah, the Dead Sea, in accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through his servant Jonah, and this we referred to several weeks back, that could, could the messenger that Elijah sent, Elisha sent could have been jo Jonah. And so he's mentioned here, the servant of Jonah, son of Amittah, the prophet from Gath, Hefer. And with that, it goes on, just kind of inserts that in accordance with the word of the Lord the, spoken through his servant Jonah. The Lord had seen how bitterly, every, how bitterly everyone in Israel, whether slave or free, was suffering. There was no one to help them. And since the Lord had not said he would blot out the name of Israel, not yet, uh, or not the northern kingdom I'm talking about here, the name of Israel from under heaven, he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, son of Joash, Jehoash. As for the other events of Jeroboam's reign, all he did and his military achievements, including how he recovered for Israel both Damascus, up in Aram, or, or Syria today, and Hamath, which had belonged to Yadi, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? Jeroboam rested with his fathers, the kings of Israel, and Zechariah, his son, succeeded him as king. So we're, uh, we're at the point of, of uh, yeah, Amaziah, finishing off of Amaziah there, which I've already checked off. So, and then Jeroboam finishes uh, the next part of the kingdom. Chapter 15, we get several kings here. Some had very short reigns for the kings of Israel. And I think we can, you know, we can definitely get through chapter 15. So let me read each of these. Azariah, Azariah on your sheet, uh, would be we can not considered, he was considered a good king. So you, you had Joash, a good king, Amaziah, a good king, followed by Azariah, or Uzziah, Uzariah, um, also. And then following him, there will be Jotham later. So there were four straight good kings of Judah that are intermixed with these bad kings of, of Israel. So let me read chapter 15. In the 27th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel. So the king of Israel is, is still 
um, in charge. Azariah, son of Amaziah, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 16 years old when he became king, again, a young king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 50, 52 years. He was one of the longest reigning kings. His mother's name was Jacola. She was from Jerusalem. Important point, verse 3, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father Amaziah had done. The high places, again, however, were not removed. The people continued to offer sacrifices and burn incense there. I just read that several times through these writings, that even though uh, they did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, they were still subject to false gods. And, you know, again, I, I try to bring this to relevance for our time. You know, you, you look at even, even as hard as we try to follow the Lord's way and be in accordance with God's word, we have all these other things that are weighing on us and around us, tempting us, telling us that if you don't do this, you're not a good person, you know, or whatever. And, you, and when we know it's not in God's way of doing things, and still we're sympathetic, if you want to say, or we're subject to the ways of the world, and we're drawn to it. So that's why I look at this, leaving some of the false gods that they've been accustomed to worshiping, sacrificing to, uh, uh, doing sexual morality, because that's really what these high place gods they did. They thought it would stimulate the gods to bring them a harvest, to bring them crops, whatever. And so all that continued to go on, even in the time of the kings of Judah, who were basically called good kings, but they still, you know, kind of. Um, gave in, gave in to the temptations of keeping some of these false gods um, that, would uh, that they would deal with. The high places, however, were not removed. The people continued to offer sacrifices and burn, in, burn incense there. The Lord afflicted the king. Now there's consequences of these things. Just keep following these, these patterns. This particular king, Jeroboam, king of Israel, and he was considered a good king. But look at what was inflicted upon him. The Lord afflicted the king with leprosy. You know, in those days, and maybe even some extent those that might be affected by it today, it's one, one of the really terrible diseases. Um, until the day he died. So he, he wasn't healed from it. And so... I think by not doing the totality of God's work, you know, work, um, he suffered some consequences until the day he died, and he lived in a separate house because he had to be kept away from other people. Jotham, the king's son, had charge of the palace and governed the people of the land. So his son kind of took over some of the responsibilities. All this was going on, and he was stricken with leprosy. As for the other events of Azariah's reign and all he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? Azariah rested with his fathers and was buried near them in the city of, of David. And Jotham, his son, succeeded him as king. Now we're going to move kind of quickly through these, these uh, next kings, which are kings of Judah, or kings of Israel. And most of those didn't last very long. You had Zechariah on the sheet that only lasted six months. Shalom lasted one month. And then Menahem actually stayed in power for 10 years. And Pekah, uh, two years uh, for him. And so let's just kind of go through these. Zechariah, the king of Israel. Don't get him mixed up with other Zacharias in the Bible. In the 38th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Zechariah, son of Jeroboam, became king of Israel in Samaria, and he reigned six months. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, as his fathers had done. 
He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat. So continue, continue that line in the, in the northern kingdom of Israel, which he had caused Israel to commit. It started with him, the son of Solomon. Shalom, son of Jabesh. So this is a whole different line. This is not part of the, the kingly line. Shalom, son of Jabesh, conspired against Zechariah. He attacked him in front of the people, assassinated him, and succeeded, uh, su yeah, succeeded as him as king. The other events of Zechariah's reign are written in the book of the Annals of the Kings of Israel. So the word of the Lord spoken to Jehu was fulfilled. This completed the four generations following uh, Jehu. Your descendants will sit on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation because Jehu was given a little bit of a blessing by God that his descendants would reign longer than the average uh, king of Israel. But now we see with Shalom, 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 the son of Jabesh, became king in the 39th year of Uzziah, same, same person as Azariah, Azariah, Uzziah is also used, both used uh, for that same king of Judah, and he reigned in Samaria one month. Then Menahem, son of Gadi, went from Tirzah up to Samaria. He attacked Shalom, son of Jabesh, in Samaria, assassinated him. How many assassinations have we had here? Quite a few, haven't we? <laughs> assassinated him and succeeded him as king. The other events of Shalom, Shalom uh, reign and the conspiracy he led are written in the book of the Annals of the Kings of Israel. At that time, Menahem, stayed, starting out from Terzah, attacked Tipsha and everyone in the city and its vicinity because they refused to open their gates. He sacked Tipsha and ripped open all the pregnant women. You know, <laughs> I know Kelly, it's, it's, it's tough, it's tough, it's tough, it's not right. <laughs> yeah. Anybody knows that's not right, right? <laughs> but, but yeah, so that, that was the vendetta, it was, uh, you know, an abomination. But that's what was done. That's what's reported. And so now we move on with him who has done this, and he becomes king, king of Israel. In the 39th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Menahem, son of Gadi, became king of Israel, and he reigned in Samaria 10 years. Obviously, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. During his entire reign, he did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat which he had caused Israel to commit. Then you have an invasion. Now we start to see the Assyrian influence coming down on the northern kingdom. Then Paul, king of Assyria, invaded the land of Israel, northern kingdom. And Menahem gave him a thousand talents of silver to gain his support and strengthen his own hold on the kingdom. Menahem, so kind of an extortion payment, uh, Menahem ex exacted his, this money from Israel. Every wealthy man had to contribute. Okay, so you collect it from the people. Uh, every wealthy man, well, it's just the rich that'll have to pay. Of course, that's kind of what Biden says. Yeah, so. Um, every wealthy man had to contribute 50 shekels of silver to be given to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria withdrew and stayed in the land no longer. As for the other events of Menahem's reign and all he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? Menahem rested with his fathers and Pekahiah, his son, succeeded him as king. So that's the next line here as we go on with Israel. We have Zechariah. Shalom, Menahem, and, uh, and uh, Pekah, Pekah. So we, we 
covered several kings there. <laughs> One quick, quick read. Um, okay, Peckett, Peckett, at the end of, uh, of chapter 3, chapter 23 of chapter 15. In the 15th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Pekaniah, son of Menahem, became king of, of Samaria, and he reigned two years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. One of the chief officers, Pekah, so he was an officer in the army, if you want to call it that, son of Ramalia, conspired against him, taking 50 men to Gilead with him. Again, we see, what did he do? He assassinated. He assassinated... Um, so he, take, he assassinated Pekinah along with Ar, Argob and Ariah in the citadel of the royal palace at Samaria. So Pekah killed Pekiah and succeeded him as king. So that's how you gain power. The other events of Pekiah's reign and all he did are written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel. So then we go on with the account of Pekah. Pekah, king of Israel, in the 52nd year of Azariah, king of Judah, Pekah, son of Ramalia, became king of Israel and Samaria, and he reigned 20 years. Again, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, and he caused Israel to, to commit. In the time of Pekah, king of Israel, Tiglath, Excuse me for these pronunciations. If you have a better one, let me know. Pil Pilazer, king of Assyria, came and took Ijon. Abel, Beth, Makkah, John Janoah, Kadesh, and Hazor. He took Gilead and Galilee, including all the land of Naphtali, up north, and deported the people to Assyria. So that's where they started deporting people into the other kingdom of Assyria. And now we see the introduction of the last king looking ahead. You know, we don't read about him until chapter 17, but it introduces him here. Then Hoshea, son of Elah, conspired against Pekah, son of Ramalia, and he attacked and assassinated him. This future king now, now killed Pekah. Uh, son of Ramalia. He conspired against Pekah, son of Ramalia. He attacked and assassinated him and then succeeded him as king in the 20th year of Jotham, son of Uzziah. As for the other events of Pekah's reign and all he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? So that again takes us to this point in the kings of Israel. And we're down to one king left that will see later in this chapter, but we've got to move back to um, Jotham, sorry we already did Azariah, and so we're, we still have Jotham in chapter 15, and <coughs> we'll also have Ahaz, the king of Judah, in chapter 16, which we won't, well, we won't get to, I'm going to stop here now and anyway. So we'll do Jotham and Ahaz and then Hoshea uh, next week. Going and cover, cover through the end. In chapter 17, we'll see the, the exile of the northern kingdom of Israel. And ultimately, that area, Samaria, which is the capital area of Israel, will be resettled. And so we'll, that's what we'll handle for next week. So you can read ahead if you want to. <laughs> Read about this gore. <laughs> I know. So, anyway, let's uh, let's close our time with a word of prayer and prepare ourselves for a our time of, of worship today. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this this day, this time. Thank you for all your word. As hard as it is, maybe to read and to comprehend and to understand uh, the whys of it. But we, but we know man left to their own desires is pure evil. Without you and the, 
and the, and the way that you have given us to, to avoid, to, to overcome evil. Lord, uh, we have no hope. And so without Jesus, we have no hope. And so we, we thank you for pointing us each in the way through your word, through greater understanding of what the choices are that we have before us to make in our lives around us. Give us a heart. Give us a heart, Lord, for the lost who are headed to a place that you don't, you don't want anybody to go to. You created it originally for the devil and his fallen angels. And so we, we don't want anyone to go to hell. But we know that without, without Jesus, we're destined there. So thank you, Lord, for your provision. Thank you for um, giving us your word that we can study and grow in our understanding. And then give us the, the, uh, the opportunity to join together as fellow believers in Jesus Christ and come and worship you. And... Uh, and worship you by prayer, by music and singing, by the word that's shared, by the message that's delivered, by the fellowship that we have with one another, uh, demonstrating our, our love for each other. And um, we just thank you for this opportunity we now have in our time of worship this day and our fellowship meal afterwards. Lord, we thank you once again that we can gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ and we can uh, lift up our praises and honor to you and celebrate with, with each other and, and grow in our fellowship with one another. Thank you for this time and, and the rest of this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.